Hey, everybody. Welcome to the live stream on Wednesday. And what we're going to talk about is stress, fat, how stress makes you fat. And it's got this huge hormonal connection. And I want to bring to light some material, some studies that when you guys read them, if you didn't know the biochemistry, which you know I love doing, so I'm going to do for you tonight, it would be so easy to misunderstand the connection be behind carbohydrates and fat and stress. So I'm going to be using the macronutrients and show you how diet and stress work together to make you fatter. So you may have guessed the connection here is going to be insulin resistant, which most people don't even know they have, right? So the idea is tonight, we're going to talk about stress fat. I have talked about this a little bit before, and I got a lot of really good reception on a live stream I did on this. So I thought I would bring it back, but add a lot more science to it. So let's get right into it. Tell me if you don't see my um, page here, because I always seem to screw up on doing that, but I think I'm going to get it right tonight. Let's hope. Okay, great. All right. So how to eat to stop stress fat? Well, really, what is stress fat? And why do people get stressed and fat? <laughs> so first of all, what is stress fat? And I kind of made that up. I don't think there's really a true medical terminology, stress fat. But anyways, the role of stress in obesity. And the thing, and I'm going to bring, bring some studies in, draw some connections, and then we're going to bring the biochemistry and tie it all together for you guys. All right. So this study here talks about specifically chronic stress-induced dysfunction in the sympathetic nerve system and the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, which we're going to talk about, which favors obesity and the other way around. So there's this bio-directional thing that goes on. So what does that mean? Well, here it is, really simple. There's a dysfunction in the sympathetic nervous system, and that nervous system deals with the hypothalamic, and that is where we have the appetite center. You help with the, the hypothalamic center in the brain is where mood, appetite, that dysfunctions along with the pituitary and the adrenal. So these hormones are responsible for making our stress hormones, our fight or flight. So you're going to get the uh, cortisols, epinephrine, and the catecholamines. Now, you've probably heard of the other two, but what's a catecholamine? Catecholamine is a hormone that's released when exercises are, when, when your uh, muscles are exercising. So when muscles are out there doing a lot of vigorous energy, they release a hormone called catecholamine. So we're going to go through this and explain how those hormones are affected when we get stressed and how food interplays with that. So let's look at a couple other studies. Appetite regulator, the hypothalamus. And in this study, it talks about the relationship between the stress and hypothalamus. <clears throat> and in this article, if you look in the highlighted area, it talks about generally acute stress results in a decreased eating, okay? So, <clears throat> excuse me, a, a, acute stress would be something that, like taking a test to school, okay? It's just acute, it's sudden, something that's happening very brief. And then there's chronic stress. And chronic stress is sort of that low-line stress that a lot of times people don't even know they have. So they're like, well, I'm not really stressed. I don't think I'm stressed, but they are. They have a job that's that's maybe demanding and they're not on this chronic alert, but they're on this low grade stress, this kind of chronic all the time. Okay, so <clears throat> the key there is the acute stress, not a problem with weight, but the chronic stress is where we're going to see an obesity problem in relationship to these fight or flight hormones. And what they talk about here is that further studies uh, link the biological markers of stress response, which are these hormones with neurotransmitters in the brain that affect the appetite. And this is where in obesity, what we're finding with people that, that carry excess body fat <clears throat> is these 
these transporters, these these um, transmitters in the brain actually are dysfunctional. So they don't work like they should. And what happens is their appetite gets disrupted just for the simple fact that they're obese. So there's this relationship that these neurotransmitters can cause obesity and that obesity can cause these neurotransmitters, which means that <clears throat> when these neurotransmitters are not on cue, when they're dysfunctional, your appetite is deregulated. And what's a deregulated appetite? It's when you eat when you're not physiologically hungry. So you're eating not because you're hungry, not because you actually need food. You're eating because the body is giving you triggers to eat. And these hormones get triggered through stress. And this causes a biodirectional where you're going to get more obese because of it. And we're going to tie in how insulin resistance even makes it worse. So <clears throat> up at the top in the highlighted area, it talks about appetite is tightly regulated phenomenon and involves the interplay of various hormones and neurotransmitters for its effective control. So there you go. The appetite is affected by neurotransmitters, by peptides, by signals. And we know this because in the Myrna method, <clears throat> I talk a lot about how we trigger these biochemical triggers, these imbalances that actually have us eating when maybe we normally wouldn't eat, right? That we're not really eating out of needing nutrients. We're eating out of some biochemical trigger. So it talks about in this particular area, two primary mechanisms by which appetite is regulated include the central nervous system regulators and peripheral regulators. When we think of peripheral, we're going to talk about muscles because I have talked about this one before in the course. And I want to blow up this one area because I know you guys that listen to my live stream have heard me talk about this before. Neuropeptide Y. So if you look right here in this study, they talk about neuropeptide Y. And neuropeptide Y is one of those neurotransmitters that is a, a an effector on your appetite. So when we have a lot of neuropeptide Y circulating up in the brain, you're going to be hungrier than you should. Now, this is different than the dopamine centers that get hit, the pleasure centers. We'll talk a little bit about that so I can tie it all together for you. This is actually a messenger, a peptide <clears throat> that signals the brain to increase your appetite. And we have heard of this before because when glycogen levels in the muscle get low, when you're on, like I talk about low carb diets, but it could just be that you're just going through more carbs and you're eating, but typically it's a low carb diet. And when I refer to the muscle method that you got to eat the carbs, because if you don't eat the carbs, the muscle will send a neurotransmitter to the brain, neuropeptide Y, there it is, that's the messenger, sends the messenger to the brain that has you increase your appetite for more carbs. And that's the big um, thing I kind of want to get is this, this feedback loop that we're going to see a lot with these hormones and this appetite trigger. So neuropeptide Y is a peptide, is a messenger. So a peptide is kind of like a hormone, acts like a hormone, but it's a, it's a group of proteins that are on 100% like hormones, but they're little messengers. So they have similar properties, but this particular messenger goes to the brain and says, I want more carbs. And we know that with a low carb diet, um, that can mean that, you know, if we're doing a low carb diet, especially if we get around a carb, then we tend to overeat. Neuropeptide Y is the neurotransmitter that's involved in that. That's that little messenger that makes you want to eat more than you normally would. So if we look at this study, neuropeptide Y, in relationship to carbohydrate intake and the cortisone, cortisone level in, the, in dietary obesity. Okay, so let's look at this study and see if we can understand what they're si saying and tie it all in. Neuropeptide Y is known to stimulate eating behavior and to be regulated uh, and be related to behavior patterns of carbohydrate ingestion. So they're saying, whoa, wait a minute, neuropeptide Y 
And the fact it gets released and makes you want to eat more is related in behavior. That means you're going to want to eat more carbohydrates. And it talks about uh, the, the hypothalamic fragments in vitro also reveal enhanced neuropeptide Y release from the hypothalamic tissue. And this was done on rats that are maintained on a high carbohydrate diet. Together with neuropeptide Y and this cortisol that's circulating um, are also highest in high carbohydrate diets conditions that will positively be seen with neuropeptide Y. So what this study is basically saying is, look, we see with high carbohydrate diets, a lot of this neuropeptide Y in the brain, and then we see more high carbohydrate diets. So all they're doing in rats is they're reporting what they're observing. And a lot of times in studies, that's what you see. This is what we observed, and we're going to report it. And this is what they're showing is that there's this relationship between high carbohydrates in the diet and this high neuropeptide. They don't really give you too much more with that. Oh, and high cortisol levels. So we have to do the breakdown and kind of get more information to understand the study. That's the way it is with all information. You got to get more information to tie all the dots together. So when we look at this particular study, and this is where it's conflicting, like, wait a minute, one study said a lot of carbohydrates with a lot of uh, cortisol, and we see a lot of peptide Y. And then this study talks, and that was in rats. So literally, they were inducing this situation in rats and seeing this problem. Now, this is in humans, and they talk here about whole food diets influence stress system responsiveness. To better understand the effects of a whole diet on the stress system, what they found here, based on the dietary guidelines for Americans on cortisol responsiveness, what they found together at the bottom, you read the highlighted area, together increasing dietary carbohydrates is a part of the dietary guidelines for Americans was based on maybe reducing the circulating cortisol. So here they're saying that when you bring carbohydrates into the equation, you actually have less stress hormones. So in one study, they're saying, oh yeah, well, a lot of carbs, we're seeing a lot of neuropeptide Y that is induced with stress. And then over here, we're seeing, wait a minute, less stress, but more carbs. So let's go and do the biochemistry and then we're gonna come back to it. And the reason I do this is because this is the information that's out there. A lot of confusion because we're reading a study. Somebody says, well, I read a study that high carbs, you know, increases stress hormones and makes you fatter. And somebody says, well, I read a study the opposite. So there you go. I showed you two of them that say the opposite. But really, they're saying the same thing because you got to put it into context with the biochemistry to really understand what both of them are really saying, which is the same thing. So let's do the biochemistry. So what happens is we're going to put the liver up here. And the way this works is that when you have stress hormones, and those are those catecholamines, the muscles can release them. You can have stress because maybe you're just in chronic stress. So if you have a job that's stressful and your body releases cortisols, releases stress hormones, would put you in a fight or flight, but you're not really going to run because you're sitting at your desk. So what happens is the liver responds with these hormones. The liver responds because it says, wow, I've got to dump sugar into the blood so you can get ready to either fight or flight. So what happens with stress hormones, all the ones I explained to you, the body releases sugar, the liver actually releases sugar into the system. And as soon as the liver releases sugar into the system, if you have insulin resistance, so we'll put the situation here where you have this receptor site all clogged up and therefore the messenger doesn't talk to another messenger and the transporter never goes to the surface of the cell, it stays in the cell, The message was never given to allow the sugar in. And what happens is this sugar begins to build up. 
And here's where the story is that they don't tell you in a lot of studies that you guys know so well is the sugar builds up in the blood. And then what happens is the body releases more insulin. And as the body releases more insulin, you have more sugar in the blood. Then we have this whole situation. You're going to get hungrier, but also cortisol levels are increasing. This is causing the peptide Y in the brain to also be affected. So in this situation, you had the stress hormone that dumped all the sugar in the blood, which wasn't a good thing. And I've talked about that before. But another part of the equation I didn't really tell you, and I'm telling you now, is the neurotransmitter in the brain, peptide Y, because when we have stress hormones, we're going to have peptide Y up in the brain saying, eat more carbs. Now, why is that? Because it makes sense, guys. It's almost like the brain saying, run, 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 you know, fight, fight, fight. So it's putting the body on a high alert. And that's what chronic stress is. It's high alert. And in the old days when we lived in the jungle, high alert meant you were going to either have to fight or flight. So when you put the body on this high alert, you send the appetite center into high mode, because especially if you're in chronic stress, So if you're in just like acute stress, like just had a test today and I was kind of stressed out, you might lose your appetite. Maybe you don't, but when you're in chronic stress, your appetite is always revved up. Why is that? Even when you don't have sugar dump, because neuropeptide Y is sitting on the brain going, want more sugar. So we see a lot of chronic stress with a lot of overeating because of the hormone that's affecting the appetite, okay? So that's the story on the neuropeptide in the brain affecting the appetite. And then the downplay, what happens neck down, is the scenario we're all familiar with. These stress hormones make you hungrier up in the brain, and then these stress hormones are making you more sugary in the blood. And when you get more sugary in the blood, Insulin's also revved up, makes you hungrier there. So it makes a lot of sense that if you have insulin resistance, okay, there's going to also be a feedback loop because with insulin resistance, we also see a release of some of these um, stress hormones as well. So what ends up happening, it's like this feedback loop. It's kind of like, well, the sugar didn't get where it was supposed to, created more of a stress response, created more insulin, which then created more appetite because then it affected the brain. So you get this kind of whirling thing going on that it's almost almost tragic in a way because if somebody's overweight, it's almost like their hormones kind of work against them to keep them more overweight. It's not really fair. But... I believe if you understand the science behind it, then we can figure out how to eat for this. And that's what I'm about to tell you now. So let's go back to the studies and look at why they would say what they're saying. Um, Let me pull this one up because I think this is interesting. It affects of macronutrients on cortisol concentration and normal weight men. And this talked about a previous study reported that a high carbohydrate meal in contrast to a high protein fat meal significantly increased cortisol concentrations in visceral obese subjects, okay? So this study talked about when we had guys that had a lot of belly fat, then we noticed that when they had this high carbohydrate meal, they had a lot of cortisol. And you know what? If they had a lot of cortisol, then we know neuropeptide Y is in the brain. Because when you have these cortisols, you're going to have a trigger of more appetite. So, and you know, you've been on steroids. If you've ever been on steroids, they tend to make you heavier because you're hungry all the time. You're eating because that body gets that signal. It thinks it's it's going to be preparing to go do something running or fighting. But this is interesting because if you read this study and you didn't understand insulin resistance, you're just somebody reading a study and you can understand on the internet why there's so much conflicting information. It's because people read studies and they just take the studies verbatim. Oh, okay, great. This is It must mean that high carbohydrates then cause more cortisol. And I just showed you a study where it said, no, the opposite. 
The key here is they have insulin resistance. If you have visceral obese subjects, their insulin resistance, folks, because one way of knowing if somebody's insulin resistant is belly fat. Insulin resistant, when the muscle isn't going to be getting the sugar because that transporter isn't coming to the surface, never got the message, what happens is all this sugar ends up in a fat cell. That's just the way it is. So with insulin resistant, you're going to have a situation where you're going to have somebody with a lot of fat cells picking up that sugar that never made it into muscle cells. That fat that's added to those fat cells is in the belly area. Predominantly with insulin resistance, the storage of these glucose units, the storage of this sugar in the blood happens in the belly. That's it. Insulin resistant. You're going to start having the muffin top. It's usually the first sign. Now, they don't test for insulin resistance, so there's no way you can say, oh, they wait till you're diabetic, so forget your doctor's going to really get this one on. The key here that's really interesting is the more insulin resistance you have, the more this situation is occurring, the more it is occurring, unless you're eating right, because you release more fatty acids into circulation because Fat cells that themselves become insulin resistant because fat cells do. Now, it doesn't mean they're not going to bring the storage units in because they're not like muscles. They're like, look, dude, we're designed to store stuff. So we can't just shut our doors like Mr. Muscle. But it makes that fat cell dysfunctional. In what way? That fat cell becomes loosey-goosey. That's a Myrna thing. Not real medical term, right? Loosey-goosey. That fat cell begins to allow fatty acids to release out of it more quickly, more readily. And what does that mean? These fatty acids then accumulate in places they shouldn't, like up in a muscle cell, and this contributes to even more insulin resistance because it's the excess fatty acids that circulate and clog up the insulin receptor site. So with insulin resistance, you have plenty of insulin, but you have clogged up receptor sites. This is going to induce more obesity in the abdominal area. This increases more stress response. And that's why with obesity, with insulin resistance, we tend to see a higher appetite because these hormones trigger the hypothalamus to bring that peptide Y in. This is all neural messengers. You know, that's the thing with obesity. I always say, guys, it's not whether somebody has willpower. It's a biochemical problem that we can fix, we got to fix it through diet because diet can do this. Stress induces this for sure because it induces the stress hormones. So how do we fix it with diet? Number one, the first thing you want to do is you want to make sure that if you are super stressed during the day, and there's going to be certain times of the day um, you'll have more stress than others, right? So maybe in your work day, maybe it's that 10 to two o'clock in the afternoon. That's when you're really trying to get those deadlines. Knowing that you're stressed, know that the liver is going to dump sugar in your blood. And we know that because we get a little jittery, you know, we're trying to make the deadline, we're not hungry. The body's taking care of you. So as the body starts dumping carbohydrates, well, glucose into the blood, that's not the time for you to go get a big plate of pasta, okay? So I'm going to say balance your meal, but take it a little higher on the protein and fiber end, knowing that you got some sugar in the blood. Now, when the stress is over, just go back to eating balanced. And that's the truth. I mean, I don't think there's any makeup here. If you don't eat carbs, which a lot of people with stress, they get caught in the doggone stress and start eating the sugar. And because they're stressed, their hormones are triggering, they're getting this appetite I'm saying eat, just bring back the carbs a little bit, bring in that protein fiber, but you got to eat, right? Because you're getting that stress response. And then what ends up happening is they get the big payday with all this insulin and that's where they keep going with it. So if you're having a really stressful day, then you want to make sure, I always say, eat balance, bring some carbs into the equation during the real stress moment, maybe a little less carbs, a little higher in the protein and fiber. The stress day is over. 
It's not when you go home and you do the comfort food, you go back to eating balance. Have the potato, have the broccoli, have the lean fish, have your diet with a carbohydrate. Don't go without the carb because low carbs induce stress hormones. Yeah. So here we go. And this is all about not knowing how to eat balanced, right? Because, okay, do I eat a lot of carbs or I don't know? Just eat balanced. Understand the science behind it. So when we look at low carbs diets, and this is where I talk about um, when I'm talking about when, when the glycogen levels in the muscle gets low, that's a low carb diet. When the storage of carbs, which are glycogen in the muscles get low because you're on a low carb diet, then this actually increases the um, stress hormones. This increases the cortisol. So the key here, guys, is that understanding that with stress, your liver releases sugar into the blood. With insulin resistance, which is why we saw the study that guys that had big bellies had a problem. Well, they had insulin resistant. So they got the stress that triggered the appetite in the brain. That's what stress hormones do. And they had the sugar in the blood, which made them even a little more hungrier. And then they probably ate carbohydrates, which increased, which kept that cycle going, right? So it always goes back to balance. I mean, I hate to say it, but when I talk about everything, it always comes back to me about understanding when we're talking about diet and balancing the body, it's understanding some really basic principles, understanding how muscles work. Muscles want a certain amount of carbs in their, in their storage tank. When muscles have low carbs, they will trigger peptide Y to tell the brain to eat more carbs. Peptide Y goes in the brain, triggers an appetite increase, you respond to it, and now you're into an insulin problem because you get a lot of sugar in the blood, you get a lot of insulin in the blood. Anytime you have insulin in the blood, anytime you have a lot of insulin in the blood, you're hungry. So I think Americans just deal with these episodes of stress eating and that not knowing how to respond to it and not understand the biochemistry. Then they listen to people on the internet that says, well, if you're under stress, don't eat carbs. If, you know, we see on these uh, studies that people that ate carbs even had worse problems with stress because they were insulin resistance because their body probably wasn't handling it well. So you have to always take it into context when you're looking at something to understand the science behind it. But bottom line, when I'm looking at triggering an appetite and how stress does it, the takeaway is knowing that the body releases hormones, stress hormones that affect the hypothalamus, that affect your appetite, that make you want to eat more. So the body has these little transmitters, really, that will make you, that are tied to neuroplasticity, which we'll talk about those. These are your reward center in the brain. So these are what are like your dopamine centers. We'll talk about that. Um, this is your pleasure center. Um, this is where you uh, are back in the prehistoric days and you've got all this field of ripe root and the body's saying, eat, 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 turn off anything that says to be satisfied. So when the body hits these little pleasure centers, you just want to keep feeding it and feeding it. You're not even talking below the brain to seeing if you're actually really hungry. The body keeps you in a feedback loop, a donic way of eating is what I call it, where you just want to keep eating more. And we've all been there with a bag of chips, right? Because you know what happens? You'd polish the whole bag if someone didn't say, and that's enough. You have to use your brain to say no more. But you know you could keep going. And that's a perfect example. So when I look at what's going on there, that's what I typically talk about in the Myrna Method when I'm really trying to teach you how to eat. Then we have another area, which we're going to talk about the hypothalamus, a little center in the brain. And it's in this center in the brain, and we'll take away all these because we'll pretend we're going to just single this out. And this hypothalamus in the brain then gets affected with this neuropeptide Y. This gets affected with messengers. 
and that in itself will send out signals to eat more. And how this comes about is through stress, is through the fight or flight hormones, which makes a lot of sense for the body because if you're chronically stressed, the body thinks you must having you must <clears throat> need to be active all the time. And so it wants to make sure that you're hungry all the time to feed the activity that it thinks you're having to do because that's what chronic stress related to the body. Back in the days we were in the jungle, that's what it all meant. But now it's a disaster because you're hungry, you're eating all the time, and you have insulin resistance. So it's going into the belly fat. And it seems like you're getting fatter and <clears throat> you're not really even eating more. You, you know, you're a little more stressed. And a lot of times people can, as they get older, they can have more stress, even though they're just older and things are maybe a little harder. Our margin's not as large, right? So we things bother us a little more. So this stress, just because you're more stressed, can put weight on you. And it's really, to me, it's kind of unfair, but that's the biochemistry. Because the stress will make you, and you may not even notice it, you might you may eat a little bit more, but then now you have insulin resistance, and that in itself is making you fatter because it's not working like it's supposed to. And then the biodirectional on that is that if you're overweight, then you can have neuropeptide Y in the brain because of obesity, because there's a relationship to some of these uh, deregulators in the hypothalamus, in the, in the system that regulates your appetite, just because you have excess fat, okay? So when I go back to the science on that, because I'm like, what's the science on that? Well, it comes right back to what I'm really trying to teach you with how to eat and how really important this insulin resistance thing is. So, you know, honestly, if you are overweight, right, you're going to have a lot of fatty acids releasing into the system more than somebody who's not. That's just a function of being obese. What's obesity? Well, pretty much anywhere from, I would say, 30 to 40 pounds. I've seen people have a BMI of obesity with only 30 pounds because they had a lot of intermuscular fat, right? So that's enough to start releasing these fatty acids and get this whole cycle working. You have stress and you have insulin resistance, you're going to be gaining weight and it's going to feel like you're really not eating that much. So, you know, the way out of this is you can't diet right? I mean, I know I see all the stuff in intermittent fasting. You guys know I'm not a proponent of that because it really doesn't teach you how to do anything that's sustainable. The only way out of it, I think, is to understand the science and then just follow the science and reverse it that way. Because if you try to diet, you'll fall into all these feedback loops and you'll be right back in the hopper. So I talk about muscles and this is a perfect example. When muscles have low glycogen, they will trigger a messenger neuropeptide Y into the brain. That neuropeptide Y messenger is triggered also with stress hormones, which triggers more appetite, just like when muscles are low in glycogen. And then the insulin response, it's playing this game because when you have the fight or flight because you're stressed, the sugar is going to dump in the blood because of the liver. That's what the liver does, trying to help you out, trying to get it out there so you can fight or run or whatever you got to do. It's going to require energy. And that liver wants to make sure you have plenty of sugar to do it. You have that situation, which then tells the brain to also increase your appetite because it's thinking you're going to run and fight. So all of this is creating a chemical response in the brain and a response and insulin resistance. With, so you're getting it the neck up and you're getting it the neck down. Okay. So, and then gut bacteria doesn't really play a role in this. I'm not going to talk about it because it's not even part of this. Stress doesn't really do anything there, but the brain chemicals are all affected, right? Because as soon as you start playing that game, then we're probably going to go back to the dopamine centers. So for me, it's like, it's really tough to, because I tell people, look, I think it's really tough to maintain your ideal body weight. I mean, not like struggle, like not be one of these insane people that are at the gym four hours a day, but to absolutely be able to maintain an ideal body weight, eating real food, because that's what I advocate, 
I don't like telling people, oh, yeah, well, you know what? You just got to eat vegetables and lean fish. Well, duh, of course you're going to lose weight on that. But you can't sustain it. And it triggers all these other things. I'm saying to live your leanest weight, you got to know the science. You got to know how it all works. Stress is huge for increasing body weight, especially belly fat, because there's such a high association with stress and insulin resistance. So the triggers in the brain and what goes on the neck down are all working towards this. You reverse it by eating balance. That's the takeaway. Eating balance is knowing how to manage these macronutrients, which is everything I talk about in my course. That's why I have a live stream just on that because I want you to really get engaged there. Understand, and by the way, on Wednesdays, almost everything I bring to you in science, seriously, is going to relate to these four areas. That's why I came up with them. Because everything I looked at was like, whoa, whoa, that's that's the iceberg. Wow, wow, wow. And it all relates to obesity. So as we do these live streams, I'm going to always bring it back here. Because if I can't bring it back here, then why did I decide that was the holy grail, right? So that's what I wanted to show you tonight. And then, of course, right, this is going to be a form of food addiction. Because anytime you have a chemically induced trigger to eat, that's food addiction. Okay, period. So there we go. That's where you just, you know, you can't really stop. You get into this cycle. And this is where America is. And by the way, everybody's like, oh, it's behavior. Let's just tell you to donate so much. Not really. Not really. There's science. It's chemical. And this is what I wanted to show you tonight. So I wanted to leave it open for any um, questions you guys have. Open the mic. It's so informal. And I really do um, want to like develop community and make you guys feel like this is your time. You can ask me questions or just you know, chime in on whatever. If you have anything you want to share in regards to this. So go ahead and unmute your mic. I'll check the chat if you're shy and you want to write something in the chat. So uh, I have a question is, um, does exercise help reduce stress? It seems like stress starts everything. Is Does exercise help reduce the stress to begin with? Well, you know, it's interesting, but exercise... Um, exercise actually does but i'll tell you the the exercise actually increases some stress hormones that are called catecholamines so you're with exercise you're not going to get as much of the cortisol you'll you will get some but when the muscles start moving they start releasing these catecholamines and these catecholamines trigger the liver to release sugar because the liver is always trying to help you out so you can exercise more. The difference with exercise that I think is great in this whole stress spiral is it doesn't let the sugar build in the blood. Because what happens when these catecholamines get released into the circulation, they help bring the transporter to the surface, regardless of whether you have insulin resistance. So if you have insulin resistance and you're exercising and all these things are gunked up, it doesn't matter. This cycle is broken. And the reason why the cycle is broken is because you actually are able now to take the sugar that all the liver is dumping and pull it into the muscle where it really wants to be. Right. So that's almost like it breaks that cycle and you're not getting that feedback loop. So I think that's the biggest um, benefit. And also when you exercise, you increase your, your T cells, your immune cells. So there's a lot of things that happen chemically when you exercise that with, when, even though you are going to have some cortisol release, the catecholamines, you're going to have some of these steroids that are being released because that's just how the body, what the body needs for you to do your thing. But the difference is the whole insulin resistant thing is taken care of. Right. Right. So that's where we cut this. That's where we kind of cut the cycle. I don't know if that helped, but 
No, I think I understand. It basically it creates those those chemicals, but by the same token, you're absorbing sugar out of your into your bus back into your muscle. So the right. net effect is benefit, is right. the way I interpret that. Yeah. So what they say that's beautiful about exercise is that it reverses obesity. It really doesn't reverse obese, obesity because or diabetes. What it does is it just allows the sugar that's maybe heavy in the bloodstream, it allows it into the muscle. And then, of course, you always feel better. And then you will have less hunger issues because neuropeptide Y will be lower in the brain because we're taking care of the problem over here. But, you know, I mean, that's great if they're exercising. But my point is, if they're not doing the whole diet thing, I'm not sure. I mean, they may exercise, you're going to feel better. But if they don't understand how to eat, they're going to be back in the hopper in two or three hours when they start eating, right? Right. But... Yeah, so actually by exercising, if you're eating balanced and you're exercising, you will actually have a more regulated appetite. Your appetite will probably be less. It's like, wait a minute, I'm exercising. Shouldn't my appetite be more? No, because you're balancing. And I'm not saying you're exercising, you know, two hours a day or three hours a day. I'm saying you're going out for an hour. Maybe it's a three or four mile walk. Then what you're going to find is that when you do exercise and you eat balance, it's like your appetite actually comes down. I don't know if anybody here is saying, I've experienced it. She's so right. I think, I think I've experienced that because I find when I walk a lot, uh, A, stress seems to go down, but B, my appetite definitely goes down. Right. Yeah. So I just think that's interesting. So exercise actually does help regulate your appetite because of some of these hormones that go on that make us want to eat. Bottom line at the end of the day, guys, the way you get to your leanest weight is when you don't want to eat. I mean, that's it. There's no, forget about like eating certain foods or not. That's why I have all the foods in my diet is, that's why I have all the foods in my app. I mean, people say, oh, what do you tell people to eat this? Like, look, okay, sure. I'm going to tell you to eat you know, I want you to eat more plant-based foods, of course, because they're healthier. But that doesn't mean that you have to do that to be lean. It helps to be healthier and lean. But it's all about understanding how all these chemicals work. So anyways, yes, perfect. Um, during exercise, receptor sites open for the glucose, which makes for an efficient way to use glucose. Right on, Karen. Receptor sites on the muscle. So could a method of coping with mental stress, one does, um, give into stress food, junk food, then could someone have a protein and fiber shake on the side to help balance the stress foods? In addition, take a quick walk to help some of the excess glucose. Yes, that's true. So when you are under stress, um, Karen's got a great point. When you're under stress, if you go exercise, then you're doing what the body thought you were supposed to do because the body's like, whoa, wait a minute, it's fight or flight, right? We dumped all this sugar. Are you going to go move and, and, and put it in the muscle? Absolutely. When you're under stress and when you're under stress and you exercise, you absolutely break the cycle. Like I was saying with Steve, you're dropping that sugar into the muscle. Absolutely. And then the other thing you asked me was... um let me see about carbs. If you could have a carb snack. So, yeah. So when you are under stress in the, in the, in the moment, you're probably not going to be real hungry because you're stressed out, but you are dumping sugar in the blood. So I think what Karen says here is great. I would have a protein fiber shake. I would balance it with a little more protein fiber than I would be trying to maybe munch on crackers. And when you are stressed, you might want to munch on crackers because you've got those neurotransmitters affecting that hypothalamus. So it's kind of normal. You kind of want to something salty, uh, starchy, because that's what the body's triggering you to want. Not that you're actually hungry for it. But yeah, no, I love it. That's perfect. That's exactly correct. We want to think of the biochemistry knowing when we get stressed, it's fight or flight, the body's dumping the sugar in the blood. Go move and move it into the muscle where it's supposed to go. That's what it was designed to do. Or be conscious of that and don't be eating those crackers. 
do more of a protein fiber combination. Awesome. Any other questions you guys have? Check in that chat. Anybody want to share? All right. I'll leave it open a little more just in case somebody's a little shy, trying to figure out how to do their mic. Okay. Awesome, guys. As always, I love being with you. I love this. It's my passion. Hope it makes significant difference in your life. Until next week, Tuesday, we do our lean life. And Wednesday, we always find something that will impact your life and hopefully make it super, super, super great. Until next week, I will see you guys later. Bye. Have a great night. Bye-bye, guys. Bye.